I know you're not clapping for me. So <laughs> But anyway, on behalf of the MIT Center for International Studies, I'm Michelle, a Director of Public Programs, and would like to welcome to today's STAR Forum, which I'm delighted to see that everyone got the memo. <laughs> um, first, however, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items. We have several upcoming events that we hope you're able to attend. The most recent one will be on April 6th with the former Foreign Secretary of the UK, Jack Straw. He will speak on Brexit, Europe, and Trump. On April 11th, <laughs> yes, we, we've got a whole lot of good events in store for us. Um, on April 11th, we have an event on digital innovation and Africa, which will explore the consequences of Africa's leapfrog into new technologies. And on April 12th, we have a book talk with Ambassador Celso Amarim. He's Brazil's former Minister of Foreign Relations. His book is entitled Acting Globally, Memoirs of Brazil's Assertive Foreign Policy. Details for these talks and others are available on our website, or you can pick up a flyer on your way out. Today's talk will conclude with a Q&A from the audience. Um, for those asking questions, we really need you to line up behind the mics. Um, we also ask that you are considerate of time and of others who want to ask questions, because this is a question and answer session, not a personal statement session. <laughs> Finally, it's truly an honor to introduce a man who needs no introduction. Please join me in welcoming Noam Chomsky. First question, as always, is can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, for quite a few years, I've been intrigued by an interesting debate that took place about 25 years ago uh, between two great scientists, uh, Carl Sagan, Ernst Meyer. Uh, they were discussing uh, the likelihood of finding intelligent life uh, extraterrestrial intelligent life. And Sagan, who looked at it from the point of view of an astrophysicist, uh, calculated the number of planets, more or less like Earth, and concluded that the chances are quite high. Uh, Meyer, looking at it as a biologist, uh, said, look, we have only one uh, uh, a test case, namely Earth, uh, which has had about 50 billion species, and we can raise the question whether, uh, what are the criteria for uh, biological success on Earth with 50,000, 50 billion cases to look at. And he pointed out that there is a striking regularity. Uh, the species that are successful, that a lot of them around basically, are those that uh, mutate quickly like bacteria or those that have a fixed niche, like beetles, and they just stay there no matter what happens. And as you move up the scale of what we call intelligence, a biological success declines. So there are not many mammals, there are very few apes. Uh, uh, the only reason there's a lot of cows is because we domesticate them. But uh, by and large, uh, biological success declines as intelligence increases. Uh, humans look like an exception, but that's a statistical blip, just a tiny moment of uh, evolutionary time, last couple thousand years, actually. So his conclusion is that, uh, I'll quote him, the history of life on Earth refutes the claim that it is better to be smart than to be stupid. Uh, it what it shows, in fact, is it's much better to be stupid than smart. Uh, that's the conclusion. He also points out that the average lifespan of a species is about 100,000 years. Uh, we've 
doubled it. We're about 200,000, so we're a little beyond the expected extinction point. Uh, well, that's the question I want to consider today. Is it better to be smart than stupid? Uh, it was addressed uh, recently by a very good uh, Indian writer, Amitav Ghosh, has a book called The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable. Uh, and in fact, our failure to address the most awesome challenge of human history, with the possible exception of nuclear weapons, is indeed a true derangement and uh, painful evidence for the plausibility of Meyer's thesis uh, that it's better to be stupid than smart. Well, these are the two existential challenges that overwhelm uh, anything else, completely overshadow all other discussions. And their severity and their imminence is illustrated graphically by the famous uh, doomsday clock of the Bulletin of American Scientists. Uh, it was initiated in 1947, right at the dawn of the nuclear age. In 2015, and again in 2016, it was moved, the hand was moved forward. Uh, midnight means we're finished. The hand was moved forward to three minutes to midnight. That's the closest it had been to midnight since the early 1980s when there was a major war scare in the early Reagan years. Uh, the reasons that they gave were the mounting threat of nuclear war, and the failure to deal with climate change. I'll quote what they said is, at the time, the probability of global catastrophe is very high, and the actions to needed to reduce the risks of disaster must be taken very soon. Uh, that was 2016. Uh, at the outset of the Trump term, they found, I'm quoting, the danger to be even greater, the need for action more urgent, and they moved the clock to two and a half minutes to midnight. The clock is ticking, global danger looms. That's the closest to terminal disaster since 1953, when the United States and Russia exploded their uh, H-bombs. Well, there is an important difference between these two existential threats. If, by some miracle, we escape nuclear disaster, and anyone who looks at the shocking record will realize that it's a miracle that we've gotten this far. But if, by some miracle, we do escape, at least we know, in principle, how to end the plague, get rid of the scourge. Uh, global warming is different. It's inexorable. Uh, we might pass a point of no return when the damage that we've done is simply uncontrollable, irreversible, and it might not be far off. Well, the human species is right now undertaking an experiment uh, to answer, to determine the answer to Ernst Meyer's question. Uh, is it better to be smart than stupid? Uh, and to examine, what I'd like to do now is to examine the course of the experiment uh, just by picking a few dates. So let's start with today. Uh, could be any day, but we'll start with today. If you looked at this morning's newspapers, uh, you see a report on how we're dealing with the two existential crises. One on the nuclear threat. Uh, Christopher Ford, the National Security Council Senior Director for Weapons of Mass Destruction and Counterproliferation under the Trump administration, he advises that we should reconsider the unrealistic goal of a world without nuclear weapons that has been advocated, among others, by extremist peaksniks uh, like Henry Kissinger, George Shultz, Sam Nunn, and uh, William Perry. And the reason for abandoning this unrealistic goal of these utopians is Russia's increased aggressiveness, uh, which is incidentally a charge that's dismantled quite effectively in the current issue of uh, radical rag that's worth reading now and then, uh, Foreign Affairs, the main establishment journal. Uh, on global warming, 
today, this morning, the National Snow and Ice Data Center reports that uh, the Arctic uh, has less sea ice at winter's end now than ever before. Uh, that means more dark ocean, uh, hence more absorption of solar energy, more warming, and we're in a feedback loop, and you know what that means. Uh, the mean temperature for November uh, was 23 degrees above normal, and at some points in the last couple of months, it went to more than 35 degrees warmer than normal. Well, that's today's good news. Uh, let's go back to yesterday. Quote from the Washington Post. Water temperatures at the surface of the Gulf of Mexico and near South Florida are on fire. They spurred a historically warm winter from Houston to Miami. In the Gulf, the average sea surface temperature never fell below 73 degrees over the winter for the first time on record. Galveston, Texas has tied or broken an astonishing 33 record highs since November 1st while neighboring Houston had its warmest winter on record. Uh, both cities have witnessed precious few days with below normal temperatures since late fall, and on and on. Uh, well, I apologize if this is unfair, but I can't refrain from quoting one of the comments by a reader on this news report. He says, the Republicans have all this under control. The plan is to have Jeff Sessions and Ted Cruz's dad stand at the shoreline with Bibles in hand. As, <laughs> as the sky darkens and the water rises, they will raise their left hand, holding the Bible, and command the seas to settle. <laughs> and if that fails, plan B is to run like hell and to blame Obama. <laughs> Which... <laughs> Couldn't say it's better, it's a classic. <laughs> and it captures the spirit of the times very accurately. Well, there was a second report yesterday uh, in the business press of uh, Bloomberg Business Week. The headline was, the oil boom is back. And I'll quote it. The number of oil and gas rigs drilling in the United States has almost doubled since bottoming out at the lowest level in more than 75 years of records. While two dozen nations are coordinating to cut oil production and rein in the global supply glut, U.S. producers are moving in the opposite direction. Over the last four months, output increased by half a million barrels a day. And if that rate of expansion continues, the shale boom will break new production records by summer. The U.S. now produces nine million barrels a day. Uh, we're way in the lead. Uh, well, uh, this illustrates a very crucial fact of current history. The world outside the United States is taking steps, halting steps, but steps towards facing the existential challenge to survival. And meanwhile, the United States, virtually alone, is racing towards destruction uh, with enthusiasm and dedication, which is quite a remarkable fact. Now, of course, the oil industry has plenty of help in helping and moving as quickly as it can to destroy the chances for survival. Uh, the IMF reports that the fossil fuel industry uh, extracts a $700 billion annual taxpayer subsidy which is not in the crosshairs of Mike Mulvaney, I'm sure. And the industry doesn't take chances. In 2016, it spent 117 million in campaign contributions while fielding 720 lobbyists in Washington to make sure that Congress gets the message. And apparently it does. It's a recent Washington Post article which reports that many Republicans in Congress do recognize the severe threat of climate change, but they won't talk about it uh, because of funding pressures from the fossil fuel industry. That's particularly true since Citizens United uh, 
open the floodgates even wider for a flood of corporate political funding, which means you tow the corporate line or you're out. Well, that's yesterday. Uh, these reports are quite typical of the daily fare. Pick almost any day, find similar things. Well, let's uh, continue to review the experiment that humans are undertaking. I'll just pick a few recent dates from the last few months. So start with November 8th. Uh, that was an important day in history for several reasons. Uh, several events took place on November 8th. Uh, one of them was very important. The uh, second one was extremely important. And the third was absolutely astonishing. Uh, the very important one was the election in the United States. Plenty of coverage of that, so I don't have to talk about it. The extremely important one took place in Morocco. Uh, in Morocco on November 8th, uh, the about 200 countries were gathering in, uh, it's called COP22, the uh, international conference uh, to uh, under UN auspices to try to deal with the problem of global warming. Uh, the, uh, the, the goal of the conference was to put some teeth into the Paris negotiations the year before, COP21, December 2015. Now that conference had aimed to establish a verifiable treaty, but it couldn't do it for one reason. Uh, the Republican Congress would not accept uh, any binding commitments. So therefore, the world had to settle for something less, namely informal agreements. And COP22 in Marrakesh, Morocco, was supposed to carry this forward. Well, on November 8th, the uh, conference began. On November 8th, the World Meteorological Association delivered a report, which in their words confirms that 2016 was the warmest year on record, a remarkable 1.1 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial period, sharply above the previous record set the year before, and uh, in fact approaching the desired limit that was set in Paris as the goal and other dire reports, which I won't read, but you can pick them up on the internet if you want. Well, that was the World Meteorological Association. Uh, but then the deliberations essentially ended. The election results came in from the United States. The conference essentially stopped. Nothing more to discuss. The only question was whether it would be possible to salvage anything from the wreckage. Uh, with the world's most important country, the richest, uh, most powerful country in world history, uh, de declare having all three branches of government uh, committed to racing to destruction what could be done. And there was some hope. They looked to one country as the possible savior, namely China. Uh, that was November 8th, the extremely important event on November 8th. The conference went on, but concluded without issue. Well, the third event was absolutely astonishing. Namely, the leader of the free world is leading the world to disaster. The world is looking to China to save it. And what's the reaction? Silence. Not a word about it. Pick up the newspapers on November 9th. Listen to BBC on November 9th uh, and the days that followed. And you'll see nothing about this. Here's one of the most astounding events in history. The world's most powerful country, most powerful country in history, extraordinary advantages, incomparable, racing to lead the world to disaster, and the world is hoping that maybe China can somehow save us. Can you think of an event like that in history? Not a word about it. That's the astonishing fact of November 8th. Well, that's November 8th. Uh, let's move forward to March 1st. Talk about both the world and the United States. In the world, a study was released showing that tens of thousands of miles of permafrost in northwest Canada are rapidly melting, along with accelerating decline of permafrost in Alaska, Siberia, and Scandinavia. And it pointed out that this could lead to 
massive, huge release of greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane, uh, which is accelerated, of course, by the unprecedented uh, Arctic heat wave, which gets radically worse every year. That's the world. Uh, in the United States, the Trump administration on March 1st decided to help the process along by rescinding the so-called methane rule, which limits release of methane from oil and grass dillings, drilling sites on federal lands. So that's a way of accelerating the oil boom and uh, increasing the flow of methane into the atmosphere. Methane is uh, far more dangerous than CO2, even though it's short-lived. Uh, there was also on March 1st announcements of sharp cuts in the Environmental Protection Agency staff and programs, and also an edict banning research. We don't want to learn about these things. Uh, that was March 1st. Now let's turn to March 16th, uh, the world. A new study was released on the damage to the Great Barrier Reef, one of the world's greatest living structures, uh, which is damage that's quite intensifying. And the report said that it's by, mo by far the most widespread and damaging of recent mass bleachings of coral reefs since 1998 with wide-ranging uh, disastrous effects that most of you know about. Well, that was the world. The United States on March 16th, the Trump budget was released. Environmental Protection Agency is virtually dismantled. It's now pretty much run by Senator Inhofe and his associates. Uh, Inhofe for years has been the leading climate change denier in the Senate. Uh, he's an extreme fundamentalist and his position is that uh, if God is warming the earth, so be it. It would be sacrilegious to interfere with God's will. Now, that's the view in the most powerful, advanced, uh, sophisticated country in the world. And that's the least of it. Uh, for action and research on climate, uh, the EPA is actually a small actor. Uh, far more important is the Department of Energy. Uh, it's now in the hands of a guy who had decided to get rid of it a couple of years ago before he learned that it controls nuclear weapons, so we better keep it. You know. Uh, but not entirely. Uh, the Office of Science, according to the budget, is in the Department of Energy, is scheduled to lose $900 million. That's nearly 20% of its budget. Its uh, 300 million ARPA energy program is eliminated completely. Uh, that's along with the deep cuts in uh, the research programs at the EPA and the NOAA, the National Oceanic and uh, atmospheric administration, and also a 5% cut to NASA's earth science budget. Well, the budget generally is of unusual savagery, uh, even for the Paul Ryan wing of the Republican establishment, which is effectively running the show now behind the Trump uh, Spicer Twitter facade that's designed to grab the headlines every day. Uh, the budget, if you look at it, is a vicious attack on the working class and the poor, it lavishes even more gifts on the wealthy and the corporate sector, and along with a process that you can only describe, I think, as the Talibanization of America in accord with the Bannon, Sessions, DeVos ideal of a society which they've described uh, based on Judeo-Christian tradition white supremacy, destruction of the humanities, arts, and public schooling, and on the side, medical research. Now that's the goal towards which we're aiming at home while we race towards destruction internationally. Well, uh, practically every issue of science journals provides more grim forecasts. Those of you who read the science journals regularly are familiar with this. So one recent paper in Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics by James Hansen, 18 other scientists, uh, carries out a comparison between today's climate and the climate of 120,000 years ago, which had approximately the same 
uh, temperatures, or slightly warmer temperatures than today. Uh, that led 120,000 years ago to a sea level rise of 20 to 30 feet when much of the polar ice disintegrated. Uh, the paper predicts in the near future, near future, killer storms stronger than any in modern times, disintegration of large parts of the polar ice sheets leading to melting of huge glaciers. That's taking place rapidly, especially in the Antarctic, where it's the most dangerous. And they predict a rise of sea sufficient to begin drowning the world's coastal cities uh, before the end of the century. Uh, Hansen says we're in danger of handing young people a situation that's out of their control with precipitous rises in sea level, not too far down the road, uh, other dire consequences. There are other studies that indicate that climate change is occurring faster than at any time over the last 100 million years, uh, by some estimates, far faster. Uh, last year, as you probably know, atmospheric CO2 uh, passed the symbolic level of uh, 400 particles per million. That's considered a crucial danger point. That's the first time in four million years and possibly uh, irreversible. Well, that's only a small sample of many such reports. Uh, they're constantly in the major science journals, sometimes making it to the media. Uh, meanwhile, the Republican wrecking machine is systematically dismantling the institutions that offer some hope for decent survival. And it's not just Trump. It's the whole Republican Party leadership at the national level and also at much of the local level. So in North Carolina, for example, a couple of years ago, there was a scientific study commissioned by the Coastal Resources Commission, and it estimated that the sea level will rise by 39 inches by the end of the century. Uh, there was a response by the Republican-run state legislature. They passed a law that barred state and local agencies from developing regulations or planning documents anticipating a rise in sea level. Rational reaction. Uh, there was a pretty good comment on it by Stephen Colbert. He said, uh, this is a brilliant solution. If your science gives you a result you don't like, pass a law saying the result is illegal. Problem solved. <laughs> uh, that captures quite well the mentality of the Republican Party leadership. Uh, a few years ago, Bobby Jindal, the Republican governor who succeeded in sinking Louisiana even deeper into the abyss, uh, he warned Republicans that they are becoming what he called the stupid party. Uh, the respected uh, conservative political analysts, Thomas Mann and Norman Ornstein of the right-wing American Enterprise Institute, uh, they describe the party or maybe the former party as a radical insurgency that has abandoned parliamentary democracy. Uh, perhaps a simpler characterization is the utterly outrageous charge uh, that they are the most dangerous organization in human history, dedicated to the prospects, to ending the prospects for human survival. Uh, that is outrageous, no doubt, but the uh, more interesting question is whether it's wrong. I'll leave that to you to think about. Uh, well, I already mentioned uh, Paris 2015, COP21, Marrakesh 2016. Now, those are two crucial examples. The 2016 primary campaign was quite remarkable in many respects, primarily those that weren't discussed, uh, namely the attitude of the uh, candidates to climate change which barely got a word of commentary. Every single candidate denied that what is happening is happening, with the exception of the sensible moderates, like Jeb Bush, who said it's uncertain, but we don't have to do anything because we're producing more natural gas thanks to fracking. Or 
John Kasich, who was supposed to be the adult in the room, who did at least agree that global warming's probably happening. But he said, he's governor of Ohio, he said, we're going to burn coal in Ohio, and we're not going to apologize for it. That's the sensible guy. Uh, the, as far as the media were concerned, they ignored it. There was almost nothing mentioned about this. Uh, after all, it's only the most important issue in human history. And you can't really blame the media for this because they're following a concept of objectivity that's taught in journalism schools. Uh, objectivity means uh, reporting accurately what's going on within the beltway in Washington circles. So you gotta report actually accurately what they're saying there. If you talk about something else, it's bias or uh, opinion or something, but it's not genuine reporting. So since what's going on within the beltway, including the Democrats incidentally, is uh, denial or, re or ignoring, or in the case of the Republicans, flatly denying what's happening is happening, then you don't report it. Of course, it's not within the beltway, it's not objective. Well, even uh, sea level rise that's much more limited than what's anticipated is going to inundate coastal cities and more significantly coastal plains, like in Bangladesh, uh, where there will soon be tens of millions of people uh, fleeing, uh, probably in the fairly near future. These are flat plains which are going to be inundated, and many more later. Uh, that's going to make today's refugee issue a tea party. The chief environmental scientist in Bangladesh uh, says that these migrants should have the right to move to the countries from which all these greenhouse gases are coming. Uh, millions should be able to go to the United States. Uh, that just fits the current mood in what has long been the richest and safest country in the world and also the most terrified. And those who think it's better in Europe can turn to a recent poll showing that a majority of Europeans want a total ban on immigration from Muslim majority countries. So the idea is first we destroy them, then we punish them for trying to escape from the ruins that we've created. And we have a name for it, we call it a refugee crisis. Well, thousands of people, desperate people, drown in the Mediterranean, fleeing from Africa, where Europe has a certain history with which you're not unfamiliar. Uh, in fact, the, and the same is true of the United States and Central America, of course, uh, and the Middle East. And in fact, the so-called refugee crisis uh, is actually a serious, severe uh, moral and cultural crisis in the West. Well, these two existential crises uh, are related. Uh, the Himalayan glaciers are melting, and in the non to distant future, uh, that could threaten the water supplies in South Asia, which are already at dangerously low levels. So 300 million people in India are reported to lack adequate drinking water right now. Uh, that could very easily spark uh, conflict between India and Pakistan, two nuclear armed states, uh, st constantly at the brink of nuclear war. Uh, right now, in fact, a nuclear war would destroy India and Pakistan, uh, but much worse than that. Could very well lead to nuclear winter, meaning global famine, which pretty much ends organized human life on work on Earth, which is not very remote if you think it through. Well, that leads us to one final date to look at one of the most important dates of human history, namely the end of World War II. It was a moment of joy, but also of horror, with the dawn of the nuclear age. I can remember very well my own feelings on August 6th, horror at the events and their constant implications, their import, and astonishment that so few people seem to care about it. 
either about the enormity of what had just happened or about the fact that we had entered into what may well be the final era of human existence, the nuclear age, the moment when human intelligence had succeeded in developing the means to instantaneously destroy us all. Uh, 1947, shortly after, uh, the doomsday clock was instituted and the hand was set then at seven minutes to midnight. We're now, remember, at two and a half. Well, we have not only entered the nuclear age, uh, but also the so-called Anthropocene, a new geological epoch uh, in which uh, human activity is dramatically changing the uh, environment. Uh, there have been debates about the in proper date to, for the inception of the Anthropocene. But the World Geological Society has made its decision. It settled on 1950 as the beginning of the Anthropocene. Uh, that's partly because of radioactive elements that were dispersed across the planet by the uh, nuclear bomb tests and other consequences of human action, including the sharp increase in greenhouse emissions. So the nuclear age and the Anthropocene uh, basically coincide. These are epochs of the post-World War II period. Uh, we are also now well into what's called the sixth extinction. It's expected to be similar to the fifth extinction. That was 66 million years ago uh, when a huge asteroid hit the Earth, uh, destroyed 75% of species ended the age of the dino dinosaurs. It opened a way for small mammals to survive and to expand and evolve and ultimately become us about 200,000 years ago. Uh, for a long time, uh, humans had fairly limited impact. But uh, by now, in the post-war period, uh, we've succeeded in becoming the next asteroid, destroying species at a an enormous rate, uh, perhaps ourselves not too far in the distance. Uh, there are careful studies of species extinction and they have some interesting results. They show that this extinction is different from its predecessors in an interesting respect. Uh, the earlier ones were species neutral. Uh, species just disappeared across the board. Uh, this one, it's different. It's mostly larger animals that are disappearing uh, disproportionately. And that actually runs through the history of uh, proto-humans, our human ancestors, early human ancestors back around a million years. As they expanded their territory, the large mammals declined. And of the many species closely related to us, uh, only one survives, uh, which raises some questions that you might ponder. And that uh, includes the lingering question, Ernst Myers, is it better to be smart than stupid? And we have a few years to answer this question, not many. So how are we answering it? Well, one step was George W. Bush's abrogation of the ABM treaty, followed now under Obama, uh, Bush and Ob now Obama, followed by ABM installations uh, right near the Russian border, allegedly for defense against non-existent Iranian nuclear missiles. You can believe that if you believe the tooth fairy, which Russia doesn't, uh, they have good reason to regard it as a first strike weapon, as strategic analysts understand missile defense to be on all sides. Uh, the next step was offering NATO membership to Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is the Russian geostrategic heartland. Uh, that was George Bush, but the efforts have been pursued by Obama and Clinton. Well, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty would at least end nuclear tests, which would be a considerable step forward. But it can't go into force until it's ratified by the few holdouts. Uh, three are crucial, the nuclear weapon states that refuse to ratify it, 
China, Israel, and the United States. Uh, the major nuclear powers, US and Russia, which have overwhelming preponderance of nuclear weapons, are both expanding, modernizing their arsenals in quite dangerous ways. That includes uh, tactical nukes that can be scaled down to battlefield use under the command, under low level command, uh, could easily lead to very rapid escalation if there were any conflict and any conflict between Russia and the United States is essentially terminal for everyone. That's pretty obvious. Uh, the flashpoints are becoming more serious right at the Russian border. Uh, notice the Russian border, not the Mexican border. That's a fact worth considering. Uh, and it's a result of uh, expansion of NATO uh, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, this was in violation to verbal promises to Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, verbal promises that NATO would not expand. The phrase was one inch to the east. That meant East Germany. Nobody was thinking about anything beyond. Uh, NATO would not expand one inch to the east if Gorbachev agreed to unification of Germany and uh, a jo a Germany, a unified Germany join joining NATO, a hostile military alliance. It was a pretty remarkable concession in the light of the history of the past half century uh, when Germany alone had practically wiped Russia out two times. Well, that was the agreement, but verbal. Uh, NATO at once expand, expanded to, east, to East Germany, then beyond under Clinton, right to the Russian border. There's recent uh, archival work by uh, University of Texas young historian Joshua Schifferinson. It was published in the MIT journal, International Security, worth looking up. Uh, he, it very strongly suggests that uh, President Bush, number one, the statesman Bush, and uh, Secretary of State James Baker, who were the negotiators, uh, strongly suggests they were consciously deceiving Gorbachev, uh, pretending to make an agreement which they intended to violate. And were very careful not to put anything on paper. So when Gorbachev complained, he was told it was just a gentleman's agreement. And the implication, unstated implication, was if you're stupid enough to accept to believe in a gentleman's agreement with us, it's your problem, not ours. Well, there was, uh, Gorbachev did propose a vision of what he called a common European home, uh, Brussels to Vladivostok, security system with no military alliances. That's a fading dream. Uh, George Kennan and other senior statesmen had warned, warned right away that NATO expansion is what they called a tragic mistake, policy error of historic proportions. That's canon. And it's now leading to rising and serious tensions on the traditional invasion route uh, through which Russia was virtually destroyed twice during the past century by Germany alone. Uh, the risk of terminal nuclear war is not slight, and that's one of the two reasons why the hand of the doomsday clock is moving so close to midnight. Well, with some justice, uh, European historian Richard Sakwa writes that NATO's prime concern now is to manage the risks created by its existence, which is quite accurate, I think. And it uh, bears on uh, Ernst Meyer's conclusions. That's how we're dealing with one of the two crises. What are the others? How about global warming? Well, we're answering Meyer's question by unilateral withdrawal from the world's efforts to address the crisis, uh, not just withdrawal, but replacing their efforts with a dedicated race to the precipice, even more rapidly by sharp increases in fossil fuel use, that includes coal, and refusing the promised subsidies to poorer countries to develop renewable energy, and uh, dismantling the regulatory apparatus 
so that profits can boom along with threats to survival. And we can't stress too strongly the enormity of the fact that the United States is alone in the world in this respect since November 8th. And the no less astonishing fact that this extraordinary development barely registers in the so-called information system should have regular screaming headlines and be the most prominent issue in the academic and intellectual world, which is more evidence about the great derangement. And no less astonishing is the fact that while the richest and most powerful country in world history with incomparable advantages is leading the effort to intensify the likely disaster. While that's happening, efforts to avert the catastrophe are being led worldwide by what we call primitive societies. The First Nations in Canada, uh, tribal and Aboriginal societies elsewhere. So for example, Ecuador, which has a large indigenous population, sought aid from European countries, rich European countries, to allow it to keep its oil reserves underground where they ought to be, even at a cost of considerable profit. Uh, the aid was refused. Uh, Ecuador revised its constitution in 2008 to include what are called the rights of nature, having intrinsic worth. The same in Bolivia with an indigenous majority. And quite generally, the countries with large and uh, influential indigenous populations are well in the lead in seeking to preserve the planet, while the countries that have driven indigenous populations to extinction or extreme marginalization are racing towards destruction, which is perhaps something more to think about. Well, outside of the world center of devastation and destruction, which is right here, uh, some things are being done. Not enough by any means, but not negligible, and an indication of what can be done. So Denmark is aiming to reach 100% renewable electricity within 20 years, and in all sectors by 2050. Uh, Germany, which is the most successful state capitalist economy, has tripled renewable energy for electricity in the past decade, aims to increase it by almost half by 2025, and more than 80% by 2050, and by then to have reduced greenhouse gas reductions to uh, 80 or 90% of 1990 levels. Uh, China, which is still a huge polluter, uh, is well in the lead in production of solar panels and also development of advanced solar technology uh, claims to be phasing out sol coal plants. In the United States, uh, Hawaii passed a law mandating that all the state's electricity will come from renewable sources no later than 2045. And right here, uh, several Massachusetts Democrats have filed a bill, that's SD 1932 if you want to look it up, uh, which requires that the state use 100% renewable energy by 2035 and mandates elimination of all fossil fuels in the state by 2050, so 100% renewables. Uh, San Diego is the first large city uh, to uh, have to plan to run on 100% renewable energy and cut greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2035. And that's incidentally a bipartisan effort. The Republican mayor endorsed the climate action plan that was unanimously approved by the Democrat-controlled city council in December. That's San Diego. Uh, so, and in fact, in a period when the federal government is in the hands of bulls in the china shop, uh, states and cities can still do quite a lot. And the federal government could also do so in the right hands. 
So one of Hillary Clinton's programs was to shift all households to total renewable energy in four years, it's quite feasible, it would create many jobs along with uh, weatherization and other forms of conservation. And federal regulations in recent years have had some positive effects, uh, unfortunately counterbalanced by support for greater fossil fuel production. There's a final assessment by the Obama administration. It was published in Science, the journal Science, a couple months ago. It reports that by 2015, in 2015, total energy consumption was 2.5% lower than it was in 2008, while the economy grew by 10%. Now, the reduction is by no means enough, but it does remind us that growth is not in itself a menace to the environment. Depends on what kind of growth. So for example, development of a ra rational mass transportation system or development of renewable energy or growth in education and R&D, uh, they can all, that's growth and it can all improve uh, prospects for addressing uh, the crises while also significantly improving lives. Uh, the Obama assessment reports that about 2.2 million Americans are employed in the design, installation, manufacture of energy efficiency products and services as compared with half that number employed in the production of fossil fuels and their use for electric power generation. And the current oil bloom, which I mentioned earlier, creates almost no jobs uh, because it's almost all automated. Well, again, it's nowhere near enough, but not insignificant and more important, an indication of what can be done. And there's good reason to think it can. Uh, Harvey Michaels, who's research director of energy management at Sloan, Sloan School here, uh, he's shown, uh, I think, persuasively how ambitious but feasible measures beyond those now contemplated internationally, that's internationally apart from the Republican US, uh, such measures could meet the goal of keeping global temperatures below two degrees centigrade. That's considered the major danger point. Uh, the uh, Ernie Moniz, now back at MIT, has produced figures about declining costs for clean energy technologies that lead him to conclude, I'll quote him, that climate change may have inspired the energy revolution, but price makes it inevitable, and maybe even in time, at least with enough effort. Well, replacing fossil fuels by renewable energy is the major issue, but it's not the only one. Uh, the UN Economic Program, uh, summarizing recent scientific studies, estimates that industrial meat production contributes about 10 to 25 percent of total greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, not so much CO2 as uh, methane and nitrous oxide, both greenhouse gases. Uh, the variation in the estimates depends on whether the figures uh, take into account deforestation and other land use changes associated with livestock. Now, livestock is about 80% of agricultural emissions. Now, this is mostly industrial meat production, uh, which uh, is quite vicious, as you know. It's designed to maximize profit with animals treated as efficient production elements, uh, awful effects on animals, uh, but also a significant uh, increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Actually, pre-capitalist animal agriculture didn't have those problems. Uh, quote from the UN report, under natural conditions, which were maintained for thousands of years and still widely exist around the world, there's a closed circular system in which some animals feed themselves from landscape types which would otherwise be of little use to humans. They thus convert energy stored in plants into food, 
while at the same time fertilizing the ground with their excrements. Although not an intensive form of production, this coexistence and use of marginal resources was, and still is in some regions, an efficient symbiosis between plant life, animal life, and human needs. But uh, capitalist industrial production aimed at profit maximization has changed all that. Well, I mentioned that with the federal government now turned into a wrecking machine, states and cities can do quite a lot. And uh, that same is true for every one of us. There are major issues of education and organizing uh, that have to be faced. And again, some of these are unique to the United States in the developed world. Uh, one of them is the extraordinary power in the United States of fundamentalist religious doctrines. So about 40% of the population dismiss the threat of global warming on religious grounds. Uh, they regard it as either certain or highly probable that within a few decades, the second coming will put an end to the problem. Uh, well, it's important to remember in this connection that the United States is a kind of a cultural outlier in some respects. Uh, prior to the Second World War, uh, the United States was by far the most powerful economy, uh, but it was not a major center of uh, uh, scientific or general culture. So if you wanted to be a physicist, you'd go to Germany. You want to be a writer, an artist, go to Paris, and so on. I uh, had personal experience with the residue of this when I was appointed to MIT in 1955. Uh, one of the teaching assignments was to help scientists and engineers fake their way through reading exams in French and German. Now, that was a residue of the fact that before the war, that's where the scientific literature was. Uh, took a while for this to be phased out. By that time, it was almost all in English. Uh, but uh, by 1950s, it was an anachronism. The changes are very real, uh, but they've affected only part of the country. Uh, it's, uh, uh, much of the population is still pretty much where it was pre-World War II. And that's a major task for the educational system. And the prospects right now, at least, don't look good. Not with the DeVos uh, Sessions Bannon conception of education. Uh, the Trump administration has to do something for its huge evangelical popular base. Uh, that involves driving the United States even farther off the spectrum of the modern world with the Talibanization project that's now underway. Well, there are major challenges, no doubt. There are also quite a few rays of hope. I mentioned some of the measures that are being taken by state, local governments, even national governments around the world uh, to address the crises. Uh, not enough, but not negligible indication of what's possible. And there are other reasons for optimism. Uh, one of them has just been reported by, of all places, Fox News. Uh, they ran a poll on popularity of political figures. And in first place, by a huge margin, was Bernie Sanders. Uh, even more among the young, who are the hope of the future. Uh, there are ample opportunities, but you have to grasp them. And all of this takes us back to Ernst Meyer's question, is it better to be smart than stupid? It's a question for you to ponder, and like it or not, for you to answer, and without too much of a delay. Thanks.
mics for your questions. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Chomsky. Um, with all these sort of existential crises, um, if, you, if you were to put yourself in the um, body of a 20-something-year-old uh, growing up today, how would that shape your sort of life decisions with these two crises? If I was 20 years old? Yeah. Pretty much the way it did uh, when I was, uh, what was it? Seven, 16 years old on August 6, 1945. Uh, I happened to be a junior counselor in a summer camp. Uh, the news was reported in the morning, you know, broadcast everyone, atomic bomb wiped out Hiroshima, you know. Uh, everyone went on to their next activity, you know, baseball game or whatever it was. Uh, I didn't know how to react. I just left, went off into the woods, uh, sat there for a couple hours thinking, what does all this mean? And uh, afterwards decided, look, you just have to devote your life to this. And I think that's, we're in a worse situation now. And there's plenty that can be done. Uh, the opportunities are far greater now than they were in the past, thanks to what's been done by people like you in earlier years, like MIT to say, uh, you could never get an audience like this 20 or 30 years ago. In fact, in the 1960s, MIT was a very conservative campus. Almost nothing was going on. Uh, about a dozen undergraduates just changed the place enormously. And it's been very different ever since. And that's happened all around the country, uh, which means that you have a legacy that you can build on. Plenty of challenges, but plenty of opportunities. And the question is, do you decide to grasp them or not? Thank so, you. So thank you. Um, I'm wondering, Noam, how much emphasis you would place on the, the possibility of finding solutions addressing the problems you've laid out outside the framework of the current political system in the United States, and how much emphasis you would give to the need, the, the um, uh, necessity of taking this political system uh, head on and, and changing it, and what, would, what do you think we, we need to do to change the system to open up the possibilities that you're uh, talking about? Well, I think there are good grounds for changing the nature of the political system pretty radically. I'm in a system of uh, organization of production, let's say, just keeping to that, which is geared towards uh, uh, profit maximization, not use is inherently destructive. Uh, a system of institutional organization in which uh, the basic functioning institutions are totalitarian, like a, a business, top-down control, you know, you fit somewhere in it, take orders from above, give them below, at the bottom you rent yourself. Uh, that's inherently, I think, uh, uh, humanly and uh, socially destructive. So there's plenty of changes that could be made. And we can think about them. And in fact, you can try to build within the existing society uh, pieces of what might be a more democratic and humane future society. It's even being done. But you can't change the political system radically unless the great mass of the population comes to a recognition that we're in a situation where the changes that have to be made can't be made and will be resisted within the current system. And we're nowhere near that. So I don't think the question arises as a practical question. It does arise as a question to have in mind in choosing tactics and strategies. Um, hi, Professor. Um, so as we all leave this lecture hall today, what do you want us to take away from your talk? I mean, I know you let, let, left us this one question to ponder about, but beyond that, um, in the recent, in the last two months, there have been many talks on climate change, on um, the political climate here. Um, speakers including um, former Secretary of State John Kerry and also Nobel laureate um, Mario Molino, who discovered um, CFCs. But beyond discussions, in terms of actions, what do you want 
what do you want all of us and also people watching through Facebook to do? Um, I came from a city called Duisburg in Germany, and it used to be part of the heartland of the German coal and steel industries until um, recent, also past a couple years ago, they implemented new energy policies to basically shut down all of these factories that were um, harming the environment to such a radical degree. And even though it practically crippled the German economy in terms of um, coal and steel production, um, ultimately the environment benefited a lot from that. Um, from and benefits? From the energy policies that crippled the economic force, which, w which was coming from the steel and coal industries in Germany, um, in West Germany, near the Rhine de Vore. Um, but here in America, even though we're having so many discussions about you know, what can we do in terms what of economy? What can we do? Uh, lots of things. I feel like we, we have, it's, it's, a, it's more of a question of balance. How much do we want to sacrifice of our economy in order to save the environment? But then some of us, it's just not a matter of action, but more of a matter of discussing things and talking about it. And I just... No. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I guess the question is, is what, what is... What can we do? Exactly. Like, well, what is the bigger point of your lecture, other so than to ponder you people this here, what can you do? Uh, all sorts of things. I just mentioned, in fact, a number of them. Uh, take, say, for example, the uh, bill that's pending in the Massachusetts State Legislature. Uh, if it was passed, it could have a big impact. Uh, it could uh, put the state on a direction in the near future towards... Uh, 100% renewable energy, what San Diego is already moving towards. And San Diego is not exactly a bastion of uh, uh, liberalism. Uh, if that can be done there, it can be done here. But it's not going to happen unless there's plenty of pressure for it. I think there are three le legislators who put it through and virtually nothing is known about it. So one thing that people can do out of thousands is try to work to get measures like that passed, not only in the state, but even in, say, Cambridge, like San Diego. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, move very directly, uh, even simple things like replacing light bulbs with lead bulbs has a pretty significant impact on uh, energy production. And that can be done, uh, takes, to, to do it on a significant scale, takes organization and activism, but that's one thing you can do. Uh, the two th uh, the, as I mentioned, the most popular candidate and the uh, uh, political figure in the country happens to be Bernie Sanders, overwhelmingly among young people. Uh, that popularity, he, is, he calls his position a revolution, but that's an indication of how far the country has shifted to the right. In fact, his policies would have been quite acceptable to Eisenhower in fact, if you go back and read Eisenhower's comments on uh, the New Deal, you know, he said anyone who questions New Deal policies doesn't belong in the political system. Well, that's just about everybody by now, except Sanders, who's calling for New Deal policies. Uh, Eisenhower's comments on the significance of un unions, labor unions, are almost unimaginable today. Uh, but correct, and that's the right wing in 1950s. So yes, we can shift the spectrum back to the days when social democratic uh, policies were considered legitimate, and you can go way beyond that. Uh, there is an election coming up in 2018. Uh, the Democrats, among their failures, have been essentially the Obama Democrats basically destroyed the party. Uh, there's nothing almost nothing left except at the presidential level. Uh, the Greens have the same fallacy. They've focused on the presidential, you know, the quadrennial extravaganza, haven't built a party at the local level, uh, school boards, uh, uh, state legislature, city councils, uh, governors, uh, the whole system, which has to be in place if anything's going to happen. Uh, the Koch brothers understood this. Uh, the right wing has understood it and in fact built such a system even on a minority base. Hasn't been done on a majority base, but it certainly can be. Uh, there's uh, uh, the, the beginnings of establishing, say, cooperatives. 
uh, or uh, worker-owned uh, uh, worker enterprises run by their own members. That's, these are things that not only can be done, but are being done. Uh, there's a whole range of possibilities that can be uh, uh, pursued if you choose them, uh, if you choose to do it. There's just no shortage of things. It is an immense pleasure to listen to you. Uh, I'm a little bit off topic, but I don't think I will have a chance ever to ask you that. What do you think about the meddling, the rush, that, uh, the Kremlin in our election? Sorry, I didn't hear. Could, could anybody? The meddling of Russia, the Kremlin, in our 2016 election. I'm sorry, but I, I don't. The meddling of Russia and, uh, allegedly in our elections. Oh, the meddling of Russia in our elections. Now, that has most of the world cracking up in laughter. You know, it's, it's just a joke. You know? I mean, uh, literally. Um, suppose every charge is correct. Let's say the most severe charges are correct. It's not even a joke as compared with what we do constantly. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean uh, uh, just take a minor example, what we do with Russian elections. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, when uh, Yeltsin was Clinton's favorite, he was supposed to be the, you know, the uh, the, the, the guy, the hope for the future. Uh, he, when he uh, uh, destroyed the parliament uh, and uh, overthrew the formal democratic system, he was strongly supported by the United States. In 1996, when he was extremely unpopular, for pretty good reasons, because the, uh, the shock treatment, the sort of free market policies imposed by American advisors just wiped out the economy and led to the death of millions of people. It was highly destructive. It led to the rise of you know, the oligarchs, many of them former uh, apparatchiks in the uh, communist system who stole the resources. It was a total disaster. And Yeltsin was the symbol of it. Uh, Clinton moved in very extensive, quite openly. There was nothing secret about it very openly with uh, everything from loans to advice to direct involvement to try to make sure that our fair-haired boy won. That's uh, 1996. And these are minor examples. I mean, the kind of thing we do constantly is just overthrow the government, you know, uh, institute a military dictatorship. And not in the distant past. I mean, it just happened under Obama in 2009 in Honduras. There was a mildly reformist government, the, you know, the tiny elite of super rich who run the country didn't like it. He was kicked out in a military coup. Uh, the United States was one of the very few countries that supported it uh, and uh, claimed that the election taken place under a military dictatorship was legitimate. It's basically supporting a military coup to overthrow a parliamentary government. Is that meddling in the the election, you know, I mean, it just goes on and on like this. It's, uh, so as I say, this is just making the United States kind of a laughing stock in the world, even if every single charge is correct, and most of them have no basis. You know. Thank you, thank you. So the silence in the media right now regarding climate change, you know, an existential threat to humanity is pretty deafening, and you provide uh, an explanation for that in your book, Manufacturing Consent, that there are certain filters that limit the range of acceptable political discourse. Um, I'm wondering, though, it seems like in this recent election cycle that maybe some of those filters are being circumnavigated by uh, increased use of the internet and more democratic uh, social mass media. Do you think that the election of Trump, the insurgent primary of Bernie Sanders, and the sudden outcry from major media outlets about fake news and the end of truth are a sign that maybe these, this propaganda system is breaking down? And if so, what does that mean for the ability to sort of break the silence regarding these uh, existential threats that we face? Yeah, I think that's very important. In fact, if you take a look at the Sanders campaign, I mean, it really hasn't been dis discussed as much as it should be, but it was a pretty astonishing achievement. I mean, for well over a century, uh, American elections have been pretty much bought 
I mean, the evidence is just overwhelming. You know, the person who's done most of the work on this is uh, Tom Ferguson, political scientist at UMass Boston, used to be at MIT. Uh, he's got a book uh, uh, called Golden Rule, which studies the role just of simply of campaign funding on uh, outcome of elections and policies going way back into the 19th century, right through the New Deal and so on. And it's uh, startling results. He has a recent paper that came out a couple months ago uh, looking at congressional elections from about 1980 up till the present and just comparing campaign funding with electability. And it's kind of like a straight line. You don't get results like that in the social sciences. Well, and it's nothing new. I mean, back in 1895, uh, there was a great campaign manager then named Mark Hanna, uh, and he was asked once, uh, what's necessary to run a successful political campaign? And he said, well, you need two things. Uh, the first one is money, and I've forgotten what the second one is. You know? <laughs> and that's, uh, that was 1895. It's gotten way more extreme since, and by now it's out of sight. Okay, after over a century of this, somebody comes along who nobody ever heard of. Uh, he uses a scare word, socialist. You know? uh, he has no funding, nothing from the corporate sector, and nothing from wealthy people, immediate totally against him, almost either ridiculing him or dismissing him. He would easily have won the Democratic Party nomination if it hadn't been for the party shenanigans to keep him out. That's a pretty amazing development. And what it shows is that the institutions are, they look powerful, but they collapse as soon as the population becomes engaged. They're basically very weak. Actually, that's an insight that goes back hundreds of years. Uh, one of the first modern works on politics is by David Hume, one great philosopher, founder of classical liberalism. He has a study called, I think, Princi First Principles of Government. And he opens it by saying that there's a strange paradox in governments. He says, in every government, whether, uh, you know, uh, military run, uh, more or less popular, like England at the time. He says this is a strange thing. People obey their rulers. And why do they? Because power is in the hands of the governed. And if they want, they can take it. And he says, by what miracle is this uh, achieved? He says, only by control of opinion. If you can make people feel that they're powerless and hope and uh, everything's futile and they can't do anything, okay, then they'll obey. Uh, if not, they don't have to obey. And that's uh, much more true in f pretty free countries like ours than, say, a military dictatorship. But, it's a, but the paradox is real, and it's in people's hands to overcome it. And the Sanders campaign is one dramatic illustration of that. And what you say about uh, alternative media, it can be too, if it's properly done. Also affects the major media, because they have to respond to it. So there's, I mean, the institutional structure is basically quite weak and can easily be changed. Thank you. Hi. Um, I want to be hopeful about our, our major institutions, our systems of governance, and uh, higher education in particular, and its ability to, to grapple with the immense challenge of climate change and its, and its like. Um, but sometimes I wonder if we really need um, something dramatically different. And when I think about higher education, the world that I live in mostly, um, do you think that there's you know, completely new structures or approaches that we should be trying to create in order to deal with this? Because incrementalism maybe isn't doing so hot? Well, you know, I, I think any of us could sit down at a, you know, a coffee shop and think of much better ways to run the world, you know, better institutions, more democratic ones, more just ones, and so on. But thinking of that doesn't really help. 
You have to get uh, the great mass of the population to be committed to creating them. And you can only do that incrementally. You have to work within the system that exists. You can do a lot of things within it. You can have a vision of the future, which people can take as a guideline for uh, further action and maybe leading, and uh, as I mentioned before, you can construct institutions of a future society within this one, like cooperatives, for example, like uh, worker-owned enterprises. If they would extend, they would, be, uh, they would change the society enormously. And those are things that arise constantly if you're willing to grasp the opportunity. So take, say, the uh, 2008 crash. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that happened then, which was pretty interesting, was that the government essentially nationalized the auto industry, basically just bailed it out. It was going to disappear. So the government, meaning the taxpayer, uh, bought out the auto industry. And then there were a couple of choices that could have been made. Uh, one choice is the one that was made without discussion, namely uh, turn it back to the former owners, maybe new faces, but pretty much same, you know, same banks and so on. So essentially turn it back to the former owners and have it go on doing exactly what it was doing, producing cars. There was another possibility. Turn it over to the workforce, let them run it democratically, and have it produce what the society needs, which is not more cars, but rational mass transportation. That was another possibility. But in order for it to be implemented, you had to have mass popular support for it. Uh, there was essentially none, so it didn't happen. And things like that happen even right locally in this neighborhood. So a couple of years ago, there was a, a small plant in uh, Taunton, Mass, suburb of Boston, which was quite successful, a plant making uh, sophisticated parts for uh, aircraft. It wasn't making enough profit for the multinational who owned it to keep it going, so they decided to put it out of business. Uh, the uh, union, Progressive Union, UE, offered to buy the plant and have it run by the workforce, which probably would have been profitable for the multinational, but for class reasons, they don't like that kind of thing. Uh, if there had been popular support, they could have won. There wasn't any, so they didn't win. Uh, things like that are happening all the time. These could lead to major changes in the society. Are they incremental? In a sense, but their, their long-term consequences could be very great. And that's true of all kinds of things. Thank you. Let's uh, go grab some of those opportunities. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I have five questions for everybody who is here, actually. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, the first question is, how many of you have a car in this room? How, I'm sorry? How many of you have a car in this room? And how many of you run your car at least five minutes to warm up while you're getting ready? How many of you use paper or plastic plates? And how many of you replace their cell phones every year? So being environment friendly requires being aware of mistakes that we do. And I would like to remind everyone here, change only comes in baby steps of people who cares. Let's show that we care about environment and let's rethink about what we buy and what we spend on. Okay. I'm sorry, but I... Um, there, there was no question, I guess, for you. Um, well, on behalf of the Center for International Studies, I would like to thank everyone for attending this event, and please join me in thanking Noam Chomsky. Thank you. Mm -hmm.